Okay, floor is yours, Rick. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the uh, this is the data set that we'll be using in the talk. Frankly, well, first of all, I'd like to thank I'd like to thank the uh, Berkeley for having us here and for the invitation. We're an extremely proud Berkeley startup. Uh, I, I'm a Berkeley I'm a Berkeley graduate. Uh, our, and we were a Berkeley um, accelerated startup, and we were thrilled that it ultimately wound up that we were lever leveraging what I think is one of the greatest technologies to come out of Berkeley in a generation, uh, namely uh, Jupiter to for this. So we are excited to be here, and uh, and thanks very much for for your time and your attention. Uh, so our dashboard uh, product is so quick that I actually seriously considered doing a demo uh, during this presentation. I think five to seven minutes is just a little bit tight for that. So I'm going to walk you through uh, and show you a number of examples from building a dashboard. The data set that we're going to use for this is this. It's the Cook Political Reports election database from uh, 1828 to 2020. Every state result for election for president in that time, over 2,000 elections from the data set. And the dashboard that we produced out of this uh, is shown right here. And as usual, my, now my Mac has decided to pop as it switches tabs. Thank you. Okay, here it is. And as you can see, we now have a slider that changes the year. As we change the year, the map changes. And as we click on a state, uh, such as California in 1976, we see not only how the state voted uh, relatively narrowly for uh, for President Ford over over Jimmy Carter, uh, but we also see, of course, how the rest of the country voted uh, in that year, the Electoral College vote, what the nationwide vote was, and we see down here the voting history of California. So this lets us explore the data and tell some interesting stories about it, uh, namely, for example, correlations between states and their voting patterns, uh, which you can see by exploring a little bit. And it's a really very compelling way to, to present data. So the question is, why don't we do it? And the answer is, well, because it's hard. Uh, it takes, takes skill sets that most of us don't have in organizing JavaScript libraries, HTML uh, code, stuff like that. Uh, whereas what we really are is analysts and we're very good at doing that. So what we decided as the mission of our company was to make it, um, it was to make it about as easy to build a dashboard as it is to build, say, a Google slide. And in fact, I can tell you, I build dashboards more easily than I build Google slides. One reason I prefer to do demos than presentations. Anyway, so our mission is to go from that spreadsheet through a standard Jupyter notebook uh, to the dashboard in minutes on the web without writing a line of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or the scads and scads of code that you have to do to write something physical in a procedural language. And the big idea, as Bill said, is that we've added a visual dashboard editor directly into JupyterHub and JupyterLab. So you fire it up from the launcher just as you would fire up, uh, as you would fire up a notebook. Uh, and the, the features of this is as one quick publication to the web, it works with any notebook, it works with, eventually we'll have hundreds of charts, maps, and graphics. Uh, at the moment, all we have are Google Charts in, but we're going to expand our, our maps, charts, and graphics libraries dramatically. Uh, and it features drag and drop creation. So in addition to, so once you've prepared your data in the Jupyter Notebook, all you really need to do is essentially the set of graphic skills that you have when you're doing uh, a slideshow like this. Uh, the uh, the, the system works in any modern browser on any device, everything from a Chromebook all the way up to a high-end Mac or PC. Uh, it works completely in the cloud. We use Google Cloud. We can also use uh, AWS. Uh, so there's no software to install. You just interact with it completely through your web browser. It's 100% free and open source uh, under a BSD3 clause license, and it's a standard extension to JupyterLab. So it, just so once the extension is installed, it just you can just use this in Jupyter Lab. Uh, it produces an open JSON-based format, uh, which is well documented. So in particular, you could, if you wanted to, uh, build a dashboard just in JSON and say Visual Studio and uh, present it on the web. Uh, I don't recommend it, but you could. 
Uh, importantly, every chart is a filter. One of the things you'll notice is that when I clicked on a state in the dashboard, uh, the other graphs were worked in response to that. That's because the click says it acts basically as a list of states and we, it says, okay, I wanna see the values for this state. It, can, it works with Git or any other versioning system. So because it's just producing a standard JSON policy, you can store it wherever you want. And it's compatible, it, it's, it was extremely important to us that we were compatible with all Jupyter standards, that we were not simply an extension to Jupyter Lab, but we were a good citizen and, and fit in very nicely with the workflow that Jupyter Lab had. Same thing with Jupyter Hub, and our Jup the Jupyter Hub we use is really just a commercialization of the Berkeley Data Hub. Uh, the overall architecture is like this. You, your Jupyter Notebook produces tables, which are essentially just a thin overlay on actually less than even an overlay, just a simplification of pandas data frames. And you can graph those and that gives you a static chart. If you want a dynamic chart, you create user interface widgets like drop down sliders and so forth, which we call filters. And then say here, apply those to the tables that produce a subset of a table called a view. And those are dynamic charts. When the filter uh, is, when a, the user interacts with a filter that changes the subset of data in the view and it's reflected in the chart. So that's how charts work. It's a bunch of simple steps. You start off with a data set, which can be in CSV or data sets, tables, SQL database, and so forth. Pull them into, uh, into your Jupyter notebook using Pandas or really anything else that produces a table. We've written a thin little open source library called Galileo Table that turns that into a table that's suitable for graphing. Uh, we have written and another little library which sends that table over to the dashboard. So at that point, you now have tables in the dashboard. You can then say, okay, I wanna filter that table. Just click on filter, say, I wanna add a filter, uh, configure it with the column you wanna filter it on, the type you want, this appears and you uh, pull, it into your, um, and pull it into your dashboard. Uh, you then say, okay, I'd like now a view on that. That is, I wanna use the, the filter to filter a particular table. You say, I want the margin table, uh, and uh, the, the columns I want are state and margin, I want to filter it through year. You only see the views that the, the rows that correspond to year. And then you say, okay, I want to use with that, I want to put a chart over that view, pick a chart and configure it using a standard editor uh, and then save. And then once you've got all the charts and filters, just add from the top menu, uh, text, images, uh, shapes and what have you. Uh, color them and configure them as you would. And then finally, you're ready, you can publish it. Just save it anywhere where it's got a URL. Uh, a GitHub repo is a good place for, for example. And then uh, go to this page uh, and say here, uh, let me look at my dashboard and give it the URL of the dashboard and you see it. And that's in fact, exactly what we did before. You can try it for free at galileo.engagelively.com and please do. Uh, please try it out and send me comments and, and particularly send me complaints. We know that this is not a perfect system uh, by any stretch of the imagination. We want to make it better and we'd like you to tell us how. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Rick. That was great. And uh, I can definitely appreciate that being in the startup. Uh, some of the best feedback isn't just the, oh, this is cool, but it's actually um, giving you meaningful field feedback on those early products. I also want to pause and welcome Kira Gardner from Citrus Foundry and give her the floor for a couple minutes to say hello and tell us about Foundry. And then we'll have a couple minutes for questions for Rick. So you can think of them now. Thought I saw Kira here. Oh, Kira, you're muted. Maybe she's not available. Ah, well, we chatted and she said that she was going to say a couple words, but um, why don't we, while we're waiting for Kira, anybody have questions for Rick?
for questions for this portion or for the rest of the event, you're welcome to either unmute yourself and ask, or if you'd uh, prefer to type in the chat, we can read them aloud for you. Either way works. Great. And I do have a question. Uh, so Rick, how, how long has this been live and uh, what types of uh, use cases and users are you seeing on the product? Uh, that's a good question. Well, we've been in beta now for a couple of months. Uh, and there are three very interesting use cases. So one is another foundry startup, uh, Core Shell Technologies, who, by the way, are a great company. They're going to make lithium ion batteries last longer and charge better than they, are, but, than they ever have before. And what they're using them for is for their scientists, uh, material scientists, what they do is they build a bunch of test batteries. And then what they want to do is analytics on the data to figure out which cathodes and which anodes give them the best performance. So they've uh, so they're doing things like constructing functions over their data set, uh, and are building and are taking a close look, grouping batteries together by anode and cathode, taking a look at those things and and then drilling down to see the detail on each battery. Um, there's a group at the Open Networking Foundation is using it a very similar thing. What they're trying to do is analyze. They're building uh, 5G as a data service, basically. And they've got a Berkeley data scientist, actually, as an intern, who's using this to visualize downtime in um, and downtime and correlated downtimes in their various data centers. Uh, and I was just on the phone with a major defense contractor yesterday uh, who wants to use this for a demo for uh, for their sponsors. And we're peppering me with questions about, well, will it do this? And the answer is sometimes yes, and sometimes no, not yet. Bill, I think you muted. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Uh, any other questions for Rick? And Kira, did you I have a question? I'm just wondering, is this, how will the, the company um, have income? It sounds like everything is free and works easily. Is, it, is there services that would be provided or? Well, you guys are, of course, going to uh, just write checks to us out of the good of your hearts, right? But the trouble with me is you can't tell whether or not a joke is, is going over well or not. Uh, look, well, the answer is actually, that's a really good question. Uh, but I would say our business, our business model is um, very similar to Red Hat's or Canonical's or Cloudera's, for example. And Cloudera, by the way, was another great Berkeley uh, startup. Uh, open source, it, it's completely free and open source, but as with Linux, as actually with FreeBSD, as with Hadoop, you really don't want to run it yourselves. It's, uh, and you don't want to maintain it yourselves. Uh, we can do it for, because that, that costs time and effort, and importantly, it costs you time that you're not, that, um, where you could be doing the thing you're really good at, as opposed to maintaining the thing we're really good at. So uh, when customers ask me that, I say, what I'm fundamentally selling you is your time. Right, we'll take care of this so you can focus on the stuff you guys do really well. Great, thanks. Is, it, is that responsive, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And how do you, this is Greg. Um, th thanks for, for the for the show and tell, Rick. Um, I, I have been trying for a few minutes now to, to try to click through to your demos and, and get past the, the agreements, but I'm, I'm in a couple different sorts of loops and, and, and can't really get in. So I don't know if others are having that or if it's just me or- Others have, ha sorry, I'm sorry, Greg, please go on. That's the extent of it. I don't know if others on the call are actually at engagelively.com right now and have gotten in or not, but um, yeah. Um, okay, may a couple. So and so first of all, let me just say may a couple. There was a, another person who tried this earlier um, and, uh, and I wanna thank him for, I corresponded with the firm, I'm thank him for that. What is going on is that we, like other people, we use Google logins, including Berkeley's, obviously, for authentication. That requires cookies on the website. Uh, what happens is that, that your security settings can block third-party cookies. Uh, and when that happens, you get caught in a login loop. Now, we can't do much about, about blocking third-party cookies. What we can do something about is better document that do our login process so that when you do get trapped in a loop because of that, we fix it and uh, we tell you about it rather than leaving it mysterious. And that you should see that next week. 
we weren't really aware of that until now, but we'll fix that. And thank okay. you. Thanks, Rick. Great, thank you. And uh, so we'll give Kira a couple minutes or a little bit of time to say hello from Citrus Foundry. Absolutely, mm. thanks, Bill. I'll be quick. Um, happy you guys had a chance to hear what Rick is working on at Engage Lively. Um, Citrus Foundry has been around since 2013 and supports new generation of innovators and entrepreneurs, um, really to bridge that gap between lab and market um, to actualize rigorous and validated solutions to society's biggest challenges. Um, we offer guidance, education, and basically like a home base to de-risk your entrepreneurship um, for the earliest stage of founders, folks that have um, not incorporated, not raised funding, but are working from the um, technical founding point of view. So they have some innovation, they have some technology generally out of the lab, graduate students, faculty, um, sometimes undergrads as well, uh, and um, are saying, okay, we don't necessarily know where to start with this. How can you help us um, validate uh, the market, de-risk the technology, and decide how um, best to create our business in a viable and sustainable way? We've supported ventures that work in health, crisis response, equity, inclusion, climate, water, infrastructure, agriculture, alt meat, pretty much anything you can think of, um, cloud computing, um, security, cyber, um, over 200 founders, 100 ventures. We have about 44% of our teams who have a female founder, about 20% with a faculty co-founder, and about 70% of our teams have at least one founder of color. Um, our applications are currently open, although they close uh, very soon. Um, they close tomorrow by midnight, but if you would like more information, reach out to me. I'm the one looking at them, um, and we have those open twice a year uh, for six months um, overlapping cohorts that we support for one year located uh, at UC Berkeley. And that's my pitch. Thank you, Kira. Um, Okay, so I just want to thank everybody for for having me and for the and for the time and and the attention and just say we we were thrilled with our with our foundry experience and we consider the foundry to be whatever success we've had is largely due to the foundry. So we want to say thanks to Kira and her team. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Kira and Rick, and we'll look forward to seeing other foundry startups as part of our startup lightning talk thing that we're reviving. So uh, I know we're running a little bit behind on time. Uh, but I wanted to say a couple of words about the topic today. So we are tilting more towards the community of practice side of the meetup rather than presentations and hoping to have a conversation about storage in the cloud. And I'm envisioning this as sort of a balance between a free form conversation and hearing from some of the service providers in IST and from other uh, experts that we have in particular domains, especially research. And, and one of the reasons that I, I wanted to bring this together is to sort of look at the different types of storage we have, software as a service of like the G Suite kind of box storage, looking at infrastructure as a service options where we're looking at more automation and things like S3. Um, and then also the on-prem and hybrid offerings that we have. There's a lot of offerings. Um, and I feel like we're also at this sort of inflection point with storage. Storage has been the center of gravity for a lot of cloud computing. You can't turn it off. As we move into more data science applications, it really does need to be always on and, and there's a demand for more resilience. It used to be that a lot of research computing didn't need to be as uptime uh, intensive, but when there's collaboration, which is now uh, even more a part of the computational collaborations and work that are going on, that really impacts the requirements for storage as well as security with constant ransomware attacks and other threats. So there's a lot here, way, we're biting off way more than we're gonna really chew in this, um, in this session. Um, but I wanted to um, bring together a conversation and also to hear from you um, if you're out there and thinking about different things uh, as well. And Amy, I think, you know, you were gonna talk, uh, give an example about research computing and then to get everybody's minds working, Amy is going to do our quick poll. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so for those of you, you who don't know me, my name is Amy Neeser and I work in research IT and I manage our consulting program. And what we do is we go out and we consult with researchers about their data and computation needs. And um, I just wanted to say a few words about storage because really, um, as Bill was saying, at the crux of data and computing questions, storage uh, can often be a really big factor. And so somebody might come to us with a question about something. And um, once we start to unpack it and really get in there, we realize that 
oh, you know, these folks don't have a place to put their data or they need to move it around to somewhere or maybe it's on a service and they wanna move it somewhere else. And so um, just really from that perspective, I wanted to just say that storage is a very, very, very important topic on campus. It seems to be culminating in a lot of ways. And so I think that the timing for this conversation is absolutely perfect. Um, so to get us started, I would love for you all to participate in a quick poll. We've put together a few questions for you. Um, so if you could go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com on your various devices, and it will prompt you to enter a code. So please put in 5187-7651. And it'll be on the next page as well. So don't worry if you forget that. Actually, I'll put it in the chat too. And then if we could click on that and go to the actual poll. First, we wanna hear where you're from, which part of the community you're from. See, we have a lot of Berkeley IT staff, a lot of staff, local community member, guest. Got some Lawrence Berkeley National Lab here. Welcome. Academic, student. Okay, so somebody from every category. This is great. Um, I see a question in chat to me Berkeley IT staff. Yes, that does mean central IT. <laughs> Okay, so welcome everybody. Great to see such a diverse group here. Um, and let's go on to the next question, start getting into some cloud and storage questions. I think if you just hit your forward key or maybe even just click on the slide, there we go. So how much data do you typically produce and retain in a year? Got some different categories for you to one gigabyte, one to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to a terabyte or more than a terabyte. is interesting because it looks like I see people participating in the bottom, but it's not showing. Could you refresh the page maybe? There we go. So we've got some big data users over a terabyte, um, quite a bit from one to 50, um, but spread all over the place it looks like, okay. Gives us a good idea. Um, let's go to the next one. So what kind of data do you usually throw away? We're curious about what data you don't keep. Or maybe you're the type of user that keeps everything. <laughs> I'm seeing duplicate data, photos, spam, emails. Some people don't throw anything away. Temporary stuff, logs. It's like duplicate logs and spam, photos. I personally toss a lot of photos once I go through and decide which ones I don't wanna keep. Okay, excellent. And the next one, it's like Mentimeter might be acting a little funny today. This is what type of data do you keep? Maybe we can do another refresh. Hmm. It's like raw data, what else do you keep? 
backups, active spreadsheets, irreplaceable data. We hear about that a lot when we're consulting with researchers if data can't be replicated. Mm -hmm. A lot of keeping of email, it's interesting. Original data, past work, MP3s. So a lot, I'm seeing a huge range of things here. It's very fascinating. Excellent, well, thank you for participating and um, we hope that this whet your appetite a little bit for the conversation that's, that we're about to have. So, uh, so I was thinking about dividing this up by categories. And so maybe starting with software as a service and thinking about some of the collaboration tools and some of you may not know uh, Luis Hernandez, who's the director of our collaboration <laughs> collaboration services. Um, and so, Luis, I wanted to invite you to say a couple words about what's going on, and then please let's pepper Luis and his team with your questions. And Luis, you can also call a friend if you want to bring someone else from the team on. Thank you. And I have many friends here. I have my entire team and I have Walter and Joe and Robert. So uh, I'm in very good company and Jolene, who's also helping us with this project. Um, so basically what's happened is that the companies, Google and Box in this case, have uh, changed their business and uh, the unlimited free uh, storage that we used to enjoy for many, many years uh, has ended. So we had a great time, <clears throat> excuse me, while well, that was still happening, but we have to find other ways, uh, other services where we can store our data uh, because uh, moving forward, uh, they're going to charge us for data storage. So what that means in the future is we identify, we need to identify other means to store the data, other services, and decide uh, if we're going to implement uh, limits and what those limits mean. Uh, but it is very clear that the services we've been using, at least in the case of uh, storage as a service, um, will not continue to serve the needs uh, of the community moving forward. Many people in the research community, and we're working very closely with Ken and uh, Rick from RTL to make sure that we address all those needs. But I want to invite Ian and John also to uh, speak about what they've seen in the landscape and uh, the concerns that we're sharing right now. Well, sure, I can uh, uh, jump in. Uh, my name is Ian Crew. I'm uh, an architect on Luis's team um, and also have been the uh, primary admin for Box for a few years now uh, on campus. Um, one of the things that's actually been most interesting uh, to us as we've um, been uh, looking at these changes coming from Google and Box uh, and really digging into the data to learn more about um, how people are using Google and Box is um, how skewed uh, the, the, the usage is uh, towards a very few accounts on the high end of things, um, which uh, it fundamentally, if you look across both Google and Box for um, our services, it's something like 155 accounts are using something like 57% of all of the data uh, in Google and Box. Uh, that's out of about 200,000 active accounts currently. So it's, it's really a very small slice. But what's interesting is, and I have to admit uh, uh, some personal bias uh, before we started this project, I saw that and uh, my initial reaction was, you know, who are these digital pack rats and, you know, why are they keeping all this junk and, you know, can we just send them, uh, send them packing? And uh, then um, we went and actually talked with them and I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, it was, uh, turns out that actually these by and large were researchers doing incredibly interesting work, whether it was looking for evidence of dark matter or um, doing electron 
microscopy of how cells work or capturing uh, irreplaceable uh, atmospheric and satellite data about how climate change is affecting uh, various geopolitical things around the world. Um, and, you know, this is data that in many cases quite literally cannot be reproduced. Um, but at the same time, it is going to become a, a, a big challenge um, in uh, yeah, uh, to figure out ways to store that sort of data uh, cost effectively as the um, costs of continuing to main things in, in Google and Box increases uh, dramatically. Uh, the only other thing I'll add really briefly is that um, this isn't just a Google and Box thing. This is a trend that we are seeing across the entire IT industry um, that, uh, you know, we really are entering a sort of post unlimited world where um, just about every company out there is discontinuing uh, quote unquote unlimited storage offerings uh, and or dramatically increasing prices for storage. And Ian, you're absolutely right. We just dealt with a new vendor who's offering uh, storage as a service, uh, a more secure form of storage. And when it came to the question of limits, they said, oh, it's unlimited. And of course, that raised all red flags in our conversation because we know that's not true anymore. So that's some, we need to have some further discussions with that vendor. Thank you very much. And I just uh, put this in the chat, but this is an open conversation. So anyone who has any kind of questions on any topic storage related, feel free to drop it in the chat, raise your hand, um, or just uh, jump in. And let's see. Uh, so I did have a question uh, about Google security changing. I got a bunch of emails about that. W what are they doing? What's going on there? Luis, do you want me to take that one? Yes, please, because I, I see it. I, I saw the messages, but I know you drafted them. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, well, actually, uh, Chara did most of the work, but I, I helped some. Um, the, so essentially what's happening is that for uh, many of you may be aware that in Google, um, it's possible to uh, share something in a way that says essentially like anyone with this link can access it or anyone in my organization with the link can access it. But that's when you choose to share a file or a folder in Google, um, uh, that's how they, uh, that's one of the options you can choose. Um, the way that works is that essentially you get a URL that has this long string of like, you know, uh, alphanumeric, hexadecimal, whatever it might be, characters in it. Um, back in uh, 2017, Google realized that um, essentially that uh, string wasn't um, wasn't long enough or complex enough and that it might theoretically be possible to um, uh, guess that. And so they made a change back in 2017 to start using a much longer um, uh, string, uh, much more complex string to protect those things. But what they didn't do is they didn't go back and um, force an update on all of the those links that had been generated prior to 2017. And so what this security update is, is, is them finally going back and saying, okay, all of those ones that were generated prior to 2017 do in fact need to be updated. Um, and so therefore, if you're linking to a, um, uh, a file stored in Google Drive that was uploaded prior to 2017 um, from a website or whatever, uh, you're going to need to go into the website and update, um, update that link. Uh, the only other thing I'll say is this only affects um, files that were uploaded. It doesn't apply to like Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, all of those sorts of things. And uh, it's it's a change that they will do on their side, correct? It's not that you have to download any update. They will do it on their side. Correct, yeah. They're, they're just changing yeah. um, uh, how, how those files, uh, how the link to those files mm -hmm. works. The other thing I will say, um, the way it'll work is if somebody has accessed the file before, they will continue to be able to access it um, without any uh, interruption. Um, 
it, how they're keeping track of that, I'm not entirely sure. So, you know, we may learn some more when it actually goes into effect on September 13th. Um, the other thing is that um, if somebody tries to access it and they don't have the updated link, you as the owner of the file will get a note saying, you know, Bill Allison is requesting access to, you know, whatever this file might be, or, or you know, um, and uh, very similar to what you get now if um, somebody requests access to a file that they don't have. Um, so it won't just be purely blind and, and break stuff. You as the owner of the file will get notified. If, if folks are trying to access stuff that you haven't updated yet. And Thank it's you. not unique to Berkeley um, because I'm already getting alerts on my own personal account. So just keep in mind, it's any Google account. Yeah, it's any Google account, including like, I got a couple of notices on you know one or two of my Gmail accounts even. So Amy and I are already back channeling that we're gonna have to have a part two of this discussion. Um, you know, we're trying to cram 20 pounds of potatoes in a 10 pound bag. And we used to have an hour and a half long meetup, and I think that's still in my muscle memory. We have a question from Patrick Holmes, um, who uh, chatted this, that I recently discovered my new team has a bunch of files on some sort of network share drive. How do share drives factor in? Will IST be providing guidance on where you want us to store our files? So who takes that one? I know Luis and I, I had a conversation about it uh, a week or so take, ago, but John, if you want to take that one. one. John. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, the, the, the initial scope of this, of our project has been focused on our large research data because that represented, as Ian pointed out, the vast majority of kind of our, our usage to date. But in fact, we know, uh, and both Google and Box are kind of, um, they, 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 re they really realize that when we talk about Google Drive, shared drives and, and Box, they're really pitching these as collaborative and, you know, uh, file sharing environments where people are actively working on files, they're commenting on them, they've built, you know, kind of these sets of tools around that capability. And that's, they're, they're pricing their services to, um, you know, recognize those value added features that really then aren't relevant for people who are just looking to archive large sets of data. Well, as, as Patrick, uh, I think is getting at is as well, and that's, uh, there's similar needs in the or similar needs are being met with these departmental file shares. And so yes, we're absolutely thinking of that in the larger context. Uh, in fact, that one of the reasons why we have Jolene uh, here uh, working on our project with us is because she comes from ITCS, who manages a lot of the departmental file shares across campus. And so we are thinking kind of holistically in this way as we, kind of enter into the next phase of our project, which is really then start looking at those cases, which aren't as big or massive when people aren't, don't have departmental file shares that are, that are pegging, you know, a hundred terabytes. Um, but, um, but we are definitely know they're there and we're trying to think about the best ways to provide that type of service for campus. Uh, um, and we're gonna be looking for feedback from those, those users going forward. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask Walter and Robert, before we run out of time to talk a little bit about infrastructure as a store as a service uh, type storage and, and, and also to make sure everyone's aware of some of the terms of our Amazon agreement. And then uh, we'll respond to the questions that are in chat, the right people can respond. And Mike Howard made a, a good point. We have a lot of offerings for network shares so that we also have a lot of Berkeley desktop traditional network shares um, that are that are part of this equation. Right, so I'll take it over from Bill. This is Walter Stokes. I'm the Director of Data and Platform Services. And I was just gonna use that question uh, and answer there as a segue, just to say, whenever we talk about cloud, we like to emphasize the fact that we do have an on-prem cloud, a private cloud that we run in the data center. And as part of that, we do have so storage offerings that are as a part of that solution. And I'm hoping that we get to Joe Silva and he can talk a little bit about the on-prem offerings and the hybrid offerings that we have. But what we're going to talk about, Robert and I are going to talk about a little bit today is um, some of the infrastructure as a service, and we'll stick with Amazon real, uh, real quickly. Uh, you know, Amazon makes it very easy for you to go out and put in a credit card and go out and do whatever you want to out there. But to really um, achieve some of the discounts that we've been able to negotiate uh, as a UC-wide um, infrastructure as a service user, 
Uh, what we've done is we've banded together. There's a number of different central payer accounts across all these different UCs, and we've taken all the demand and put that all together and have negotiated with Amazon to come up with some pretty significant service uh, discounts. Uh, right now, if you, if you, and to get those, you basically come into our central payer account. Um, and this is where uh, you know, Robert will come in and talk a little bit about that central pair account. But essentially, if you join that central pair account, you can still do whatever you want to. But what we do as a central um, IT function is that we will receive the invoice from Amazon and pay that. And it will basically recharge you your, your component of that. Uh, but by so doing, what you get, it started off as an 11% discount. Now it's a 14% discount across all the different Amazon services that you provide. Um, there's a data egress fee waiver, and in fact, uh, in addition to that, what you also get, because there's such a large amount of storage that's being used by the UC, uh, now we've got some additional storage uh, discounts that have been negotiated up to the tune of about 45% uh, in terms of S3 and all the different varieties of S3 storage that are out there. In fact, there's a one zone uh, S3 component that's up to 60% now. Unfortunately, like, you know, as this slide shows, you know, they know that everybody really wants to throw stuff out there and just leave it forever. So when you put that stuff into Deep Glacier, you really don't get that big of a discount, but Deep Glacier is still just about a, a dollar a terabyte uh, per year. So that's still pretty compelling. With that, I'll turn it over to, to Robert, who's in charge of, let him introduce himself. He's not only in charge of our on-prem uh, you know, cloud offering, but also he's your gateway into that Amazon central pair account. Again, if you want to get in there, it's bcloud at berkeley.edu, and we'll reach out to you, and you can become one of the about 70 different sub accounts that we have out there right now. Robert, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Walter. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Robert Amos. I'm the cloud team lead, uh, focusing on on-prem uh, cloud versus uh, public cloud, specifically Amazon. So as Walter said, um, we have a central pair account. We have uh, uh, 69 accounts under it right now. I think 70 by the end of the day uh, or the end of the week. And basically these accounts fall into the central payer so that uh, they don't have to manage POs. The cost gets automatically sent over to their uh, charge stream COA so they don't have to manage that piece of it. There's also some security piece and some centralized discounts that are heavily for the, the whole UC. 14% uh, is the overall discount. And then obviously we've negotiated uh, with uh, Amazon some better rates for S3 since we're talking about storage here. Um, most of it's all in the West region, uh, which I think mostly that's where we keep our data, but uh, there are some other discounts for the further regions, but they're not as good as this. Um, one of the things that um, that we we do, we well, actually, I think you should be able to share the, the website, I think. Let's see. Yeah, so the this is our technology at Berkeley page that has the cloud service that explains not just Amazon, but also Azure and GCP as well. But today we're focusing just mostly on uh, Amazon right now. And you know, I we're super pressed for time, but Robert, you and I were talking before about um, some of the automation that can be used to move storage around. And I thought it would be if you can whip through your either a demo or a simulated demo in like three minutes. What yeah, can you uh, what can you show us? I'll do the best. So basically, there are multiple tiers or classes of uh, S3 storage, and the further down you get, is less costly. So basically, real quick on this, why, um, what are lifecycle policies? That's what you're talking about, Bill. Basically, you set up a rule to move your data from the more expensive S3 down to the less expensive. And the main reason is to save on cost. And how you use them is a little link here, but we're going to go straight into a, a quick little demo here uh, from Amazon. So everybody, I'm assuming, still sees my page, right? So this is our uh, one of our B-Cloud um, ISNT-owned environments that we're doing a little test and demo on. I'm going to jump into S3 real quick. And Bill, hit me up on time if I'm getting close. Just tell me to move along. Um, and in this S3 uh, environment, we just have three buckets. Buckets are where you store your objects. Everything's related to buckets. So I'm going to look at this bucket here called bcloud.berkeley.edu, which is kind of a landing page we use for our test demo for our uh, VRA solution we use. So here, if we go to management, we can set up our lifecycle rules. And as you can see, there's one already set up here that I set up previously for a demo. And basically what it does, is we'll just take a quick look. What this lifecycle rule does is it starts in standard and after 30 days, it moves to standard IA, which is half the cost of standard. And then after 60 days, it moves to Glacier, which is a lot less a lot less uh, than standard IA. I think it's in the 10% range. And then after 180 days, it moves to Glacier Deep Archive. Now we don't get a discount on Glacier Deep Archive, but it's still really inexpensive. 
So all this is just a basic rule to move your data down the, the class list. And we're just gonna do a quick, we're just gonna create one real quick just to show you what it looks like. Um, life cycle. Uh, we're gonna do everything in the bucket. That makes it much easier. They wanna make sure you do everything in the bucket or you can do it by tags and figure out, hey, I just wanna life cycle these specific environments. There's also a thing on previous versions. S3 uses previous versions, but we're just gonna talk about current versions. And then it's really easy to go through here and say, okay, what do I wanna do? First, I wanna go to standard. I'm gonna do that after three, three days. And then I'm gonna go to either intelligent theory, one zone IA, Glacier or Glacier Deep Archive. I'm just gonna jump straight to Glacier. And I think we're not gonna do a last one here. Um, you can also do a removal, but that's in another lifecycle rule where you can say, okay, now that I'm in Glacier, after 365 days, I wanna delete my data. As we saw, a lot of people are only deleting their data, so that's not popular. So I'm just gonna acknowledge this. And it gives me a little thing. After 30 days, it's going to standard. And after, I did put a day. What, what do you do if you don't know how many days it should be in between the different things? That's like, a great question. So Amazon actually built a new rule or a new class called intelligent tier. So what you do is um, intelligent tier automatically moves it for you. So it uses the algorithm to figure, okay, you're not using this file very much. I'm going to move it to archive-based storage. And if, if they use it, it brings it back. There are some costs, but it's not as inexpensive as full-on Glacier, but there is a really good cost savings between that and standard. And the easiest way to do that is to take your current data, and as you can see, this one's in standard IA, and you can go ahead and just move your data. I, I don't wanna manage the tier. I don't know what days should be the best, so I'm just gonna choose intelligent tier. And that just makes it really simple. This is a new feature that Amazon's done in the last three years. It's gotten really good in the last year where it knows where to move it. And I will just choose that and I will just save the changes and close that. And now I'm on intelligent tiering for this bucket. So now man Amazon's gonna manage where my data is at and save me money instead of me trying to do it and know what it is. And this is great for if you don't know what your data is, how often it's being accessed or how often it's being used, or if it does need to be archived. Now, Intelligent Tiering will not delete your data. That's the big question I get all the time. So I'm just throwing that one out there ahead of time. Great, thank you, okay. Robert. No problem. Joe, I was wondering um, where hybrid computing could be used in this. Joe, that sounds like a question for you. I was wondering a, a bit about hybrid computing. Can you say a few words about that? We only have a little bit of time, um, but yeah. So when it comes down to it, all our services that we have now, we have uh, blog-based services and uh, POSIX NAS-based file system services. They're all able to be hybrid solutions. Uh, it's just a matter of when someone needs it or not. And we can just point them at any of the public clouds uh, or not any, but the main three, AWS, GCP, Azure. Um, we're also, we've also just stood up uh, what we call an active archive service. It's actually S3, uh, it's basically standard S3 from Amazon on campus. It's not Amazon, it's free through another product. We have the ability to do tiering, lifecycle management, as Robert was saying, as well in that environment where it can be tiered to other solutions uh, such as AWS, going into S3, going into Glacier, um, they're also working with another cloud provider and doing a central payers account as well from our side called Wasabi uh, in order to help researchers. And that provides standard S3 at a single price point uh, with no egress fees or no API charges. Um, I guess one thing I'll say really quick about our services, our services that we provide and that we try to provide are, um, we try to make them as simple as possible. You just pay for the gigabyte uh, per month. It includes 24 by seven support uh, from us, the vendor, and we do not charge any additional fees for access or usage. And given that there's only two minutes left and there's a few questions, um, I'll drop there. Thank you. Actually, so um, I will wrap up by just um, wetting all of your appetite for just one more thing that we can follow up on in a, a next conversation. And that is that my team in research IT, along with a lot of other campus partners are working on a project called Secure Research Data and Computation, SRDC. Um, so this is going to be a platform that includes, uh, that's it's for um, sensitive data and it's gonna have a high performance computing cluster, virtual machines and associated storage for that as well. 
Um, so that is going to be also on the menu of options for campus and we will do a much deeper dive into that um, for a future meetup. Um, but I just wanted to plant that seed and let everybody know that, um, that that is another option on campus. All right, well, thank you everybody for coming for a whirlwind tour of cloud and hybrid storage. And we will definitely pick up some of the threads of this for deeper dives in the future.